Thanks very much for that, um, Bernadette and, and Rachel, and, and thanks for the invite. And, and hopefully we're going to make this uh, quite quite entertaining. Um, I think it's fair to say myself and, and my colleagues uh, have actually learned something about each other and actually just preparing for that, so that says something for it. Um, first slide, thanks, Asma. So we just thought we'd give just a little bit of um, background um, in respect of um, in respect of um, NHS Arden and GEM, just by virtue of um, not necessarily um, people being familiar with that. Um, thanks, Asma. Um, and this just really just tries to summarize our kind of our numbers, our metrics, and, and what we're about um, on, on one slide. Um, I won't go through it because it's there to be seen, but we're a reasonable size organization with about a 90 million pound yes, ended up turnover per year. And each year we, we kind of um, generate about 5% that's reinvested back into continuous service improvement. And you'll see some of the examples of that um, and the benefit of that and some of the things we cover a little bit later on. One of the things I think that probably differentiates us as what you know, commissioning support unit, i.e. we do, we handle data and analytics at scale on behalf of the NHS. And I think it's worth just taking a moment uh, for us to reflect on that. To date, we've done a lot of that for the commissioners of um, NHS services, the purchasers, but increasingly now, and certainly in very recent terms, we're doing an awful lot with the providers. Um, and as you'll see when we get to our backgrounds, uh, we've got a really mixed background, which is great when you're thinking about how we uh, work together as, as women in leadership positions and how we've actually got to, to where we're at right now. Um, the organisation has about a thousand um, employees as headcount, um, and it's a very multi-skilled workforce across uh, various aspects, IT, HR, finance, um, business intelligence, etc. Um, and equally, what, what's really important to us is that our um, demographics are kind of aligned to the populations from which, from which we serve. Um, and that's something that is important to us and we continue to work on. And one of the themes I think that Arden and Gem is probably very good at is looking after its people. Um, and you know, we, you'll probably see some of that as, as we talk about what we've been doing. And so our organization, we're proud to have invested in people silver. Um, and we've also got the gold um, um, standard for health and well-being. Next slide, Asma, thanks. Um, so we wanted to be able to just give you an overview, really, of, of what our BI services cover and, and the breadth of what it covers. Um, either some detail on here you don't really need to worry about, but, but essentially it, it fits into three buckets with people, process and technology. So the technology is important, but I'd be saying that the people are probably the most important. And therefore, in respect of our, our respective leadership re, um, um, contribution and, and our collective learning, you'll be able to see how we kind of bring, come from different avenues and have ended up being in the centre of a service that essentially speaks to each of those. So just to, some examples, we have a whole team of analysts that work from working with uh, customers directly uh, within the commissioning groups, all the way through to um, being able to support some of the uh, very agile analytics that's been done as part of the COVID response. So in essence, we've got everything from people who are specialized at the descriptive end, right the way through to the mod modeling and predictive aspects. And so from that, we're very well placed to be able to support things as they transition from more traditional sort of reporting, how many knees have we done this year or next year, or, or, or how many hips have we done and have we done too many into what is it that's going to make a difference to population health? How can we keep people um, healthy? So from that perspective, having the right people with the right skill set and the right leadership to be able to really be pioneers in that space is very important to us. We process the um, commissioning data for the country um, and we, we um, developed and hold the national data repository from that respect. So there is no shortage of data um, and obviously all of that's held in respect of appropriate governance, but it's what we what insight we can derive from it that really make, makes that come alive. 
And then lastly, obviously, we are tech dependent um, and uh, we, you know, we, we are one of the pioneers from a CSG point of view of transition to cloud. At the moment, we're in the hybrid position of having on-premise and cloud um, technology in play, um, but we're very near the end of that transformation. And more latterly, we're really developing into app development space, which hasn't necessarily been an area we've been able to do because the commercial sector can pay a darn sight more than the NHS can. Um, but I'm very pleased that we've managed to, to re re recruit some really dynamic and, and very committed individuals. And you'll see an example of that uh, just in a minute. So that is the breadth of, of our services on one page. Um, but it may, let's make it real. So I'm going to pass you on to Clean now, who's going to give you some of the examples that we've been doing in the app development space. Yeah, so I thought by way of trying to bring some of that to life would be a good place to, would be to talk through our response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we mobilised every part of our BI service um, sort of immediately onto this programme. Um, we agreed very early on with our customers that, you know, we would only maintain critical services. So if it wasn't directly linked to patient care, all of the kind of bean counting and the other important bits we usually do were parked. Um, so I think, as Helen said, our products and our services kind of put us in a really good place to be able to mobilise this, but an awful lot of it was about the people. Um, so sort of drawing on the example around our data platform um, because we were cloud-based um, and we host a lot of the national data already we were able to open that up in ways we've never been able to do because of data sharing agreements all of that went away so we were able to onboard huge volumes of new data flows uh, specific to covid and actually push that out to organizations who ordinarily wouldn't have been allowed access to it because the patient care element trumped all of that um, so, you know, that's that's kind of one of the key products that we were kind of front and centre on some of the initial response early days. I think we've also put a lot of effort into developing our advanced analytics offer. We're finding increasingly we're moving away from what we'd consider traditional NHS analytics into more of the data science-y um, sort of model simulation space. And um, our team had actually worked up um, a model which is a population segmentation model um, that put put different parts of the population into risk groups which un ended up underpinning all of the work around the cohort identification for covid um, everything from you know identifying who needed a mail drop to tell them to shield down to you know that initial who are we going to target um sort of in that those first couple of cohorts so there was a really good foundation there so we were able to Again, in ways we wouldn't normally do, just make it available to everyone and push that out there. Um, I've kind of rightly put the apps team in the centre of this because they are like our heroes for this, I think. Um, they probably work seven days, 24 hours a day initially to spin up three like really critical apps. And being they're quite a small team, um, it was quite outstanding what they've managed to do. I think the one that we're all probably most proud of would be what we call NIVS, but it's it's the National Immunisation and Vaccination System, which uh, is essentially used at the point that the vaccination is put into the patient arm, records all the adverse effects and flows the data all the way back to the GP record. Um, you know, the, the, that was spun up very quickly and it's it's been really successful and it's probably been from going from probably one, being one of the smaller systems to probably one of the biggest ones that's out there. Um, and I guess just spinning it back to the people element, um, we did, one thing we also did is we just released a lot of our people and we redeployed them across the NHS where they were needed. So people went out into different elements of the programme. And I think, I guess one of my key messaging from this, and I guess a reflection from my own development was, we didn't have time to think. So I was one of the people who received a phone call to say, we need someone to lead all of the um, solution integration testing across the entire platform, 10 suppliers. You know, if it, if it doesn't work, it's going to be a massive problem. Um, and said yes before I thought about it and then ended up in a meeting about an hour later realising I knew nothing about software testing. Um, but actually that didn't matter because that's not what we were there for. We were there to lead uh, a team of people who, who have those expertise and just make it all work. And luckily it did all work. <laughs> 
Um, and I think, you know, we've we've actually now got a really good offer around that. Um, and we're quite frequently pulled back in to sort of lend our software team to, to look at some of this stuff. So, um, and I, I think another one worthy of mention is probably our service desk. Um, Paul Liz, who had a little team of two um, sort of service desk analysts on a couple of small in-house products, got a phone call to ask if she could spin that up to like a national scalable uh, service. I think she ended up with about 20 staff very quickly. Again, said yes, and then reflected on, oh gosh, what have I done? But that's now going into, that service is gonna maintain at that level. Uh, she's done an amazing job with that. So I think take home message for me is, yeah, sometimes don't think, just say yes. And um, it's probably some of the best work we've ever done. And a lot of us in roles that aren't really our kind of grassroots career path. So I hope that gives you a flavor of how that all comes together in the real world. Um, next slide. So, um, so Colin's given us kind of a, a great example there of something we have to spin up really quickly. Um, and what I can talk you through is something that's is, um, far more leisurely than that. Um, so one of the, uh, the projects that I've been asked to have a look at was around uh, population health management, uh, which is kind of a real kind of key buzzword within the, uh, the healthcare BI arena. So population health management is, um, is very much an emerging approach to data that aims to improve uh, citizens' uh, physical and mental health outcomes to promote well-being and to reduce health inequalities across, um, across an entire population. And it's, um, it's a really clever um, approach because what it does is it pulls together information from multiple sources. So um, we get information in from GPs, so your primary care data, um, secondary care, kind of mental health community children's data, our acute trusts, which are our big hospitals, ambulance trust data. Uh, more recently, we're starting now to get access to our local authority and social care data, uh, which is incredibly important to us. Um, and again, you know, at the moment, we're, we're a bit constricted by IG, but, you know, we, we can open up these, these kind of data sets to be expanded to voluntary sectors, schools, police and emergency services. And we can actually pull all of that information together in one place to get a real picture of what um, a population in any given area looks like. So as you can imagine, the, the kind of use cases for this when you start to kind of dig down into it are, are absolutely endless. And I realise I've only got a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm just going to go into uh, one kind of key example we've got, uh, which again is really relevant. So it's linked to COVID. Um, so we have um, um, a doctor called uh, Dr. Nick Pullman. Um, he's our Chief Clinical Information Officer, so our Chief EIO. Um, but actually, his background and his day job, he's, a, he's an incredibly busy GP. He's got his own practice. He's got a whole bunch of patients that he looks after. And as part of the um, COVID pandemic, the first thing Nick realised he needed to do was to stop patients from going into hospitals. I mean, as you'll know from the news and the papers, you know, the hospitals had to discharge a whole, whole raft of patients that didn't need to be there. It was an incredibly dangerous place to be with infection rates and people with COVID coming in. Um, so whilst all that was going on, Nick as a GP was saying, well, I need to stop patients from going into hospital in the first place, and how do I do that? Um, and what he needed to be able to do was to identify patients that were at high risk of going into hospital over the next kind of two to 12 months. And as part of population health management, we have um, a tool there called risk stratification. And in real terms, what that meant was that um, Dr. Pullman was literally able to click a button, as far as he was concerned, that ran an incredibly complex, complex algorithm that was written by people far more clever than me, which was able to um, look at patients with comorbidities, um, uh, patients that had previous hospital admissions, um, clinical markers, deprivation levels. And by kind of clicking on that button, he was able to produce a list of patients that were at risk of going into hospital. So once he had that list of patients, he was then able to look at that and say, right, how do I break this list of patients down so I can work out what clinical interventions I need to make? And that's where the segmentation comes in. So at that point, he was able to take that list, split it by age, because clearly depending on what age group you fall in, depends on what type of clinical intervention you need. You're not going to give your nan the same intervention that you would your, uh, your toddler. Um, he was able to break it down by um, gender, you know, in, in some cases, um, ethnicity made a difference there as well. 
And once he had those groups of patients, he was able to put together a clinical plan or a set of interventions that would actually minimise the chance of those patients going into hospital, um, which again reduced the, the pressure on the NHS in the acute hospitals and massively reduced their risk of picking up um, a hospital um, infection, which would have been horrendous. So, I mean, it's a real whistle-stop tour of population health. And like I said, there's a million different kind of use cases for this. Um, but that was um, a BI solution to a, a real-world clinical problem. And in order for us to deliver this, you know, this isn't something that we as kind of information people just sit in a room and, and spin up off the back of our off the back of our fag packet, for want of a better phrase. Um, we have a whole bunch of partners that we work really closely with. Um, so we've got links with um, John Hopkins University. Of course, we've got all of our clinicians work with who are our absolute expert users. Uh, we've got CSU um, collaborations as well. And the, the way that I like to kind of sell these tools is that whilst they're technically enabled, they are absolutely clinically led. And for me, kind of having the patient at the, at the heart of absolutely everything we deliver um, is, is a huge, huge driver. Um, and it's really something that kind of helps me to get out of bed in the morning knowing that you're making a difference. Um, so I suppose just reflecting what Co said as well, um, when this project came up, um, I just started in this role. And um, I think Helen even came to me and said, Laura, can you be the project owner for this? Uh, I'm sorry, the product owner for this. So I've never been a product owner in my life. And when we come to the personal stories, you know, you'll, you'll start to see kind of how we got to where we were. Um, in, in the same way that, um, that Co did, you know, you just kind of turn around, you say yes, uh, you dive onto Google pretty damn quick. You work out what it is that you need and you surround yourself by the, with the absolute best people and um, yeah we've got a project team that are working on this uh, we've got a tool now that we're developing um, that's going to um, produce a population health management tool um, that meets the needs of, of everything that we're trying to deliver right now and uh, yeah we're hoping to have a product live in the next couple of months so by the end of quarter one and yeah it's an incredibly exciting piece of work to be working on and uh, yeah, something I'm really proud to be working on as well. Yeah, thank you, Asma. Hi, all. I'm Asma Nafis. And, and I guess we've talked about um, what Arden and Gem do and the different programmes of work that we've been involved in. I think that the interesting part is just the different types of people. So analytics to me prior to joining the NHS some 12, 13 years ago was, you know, a techie geeky bod who sits behind a computer churning data. And that was it. Um, since joining the NHS, I know that actually there's huge diversity. So if we look at Arden Gem itself, we've got chief data officers, we've got health economists, there's very, very clever techie people, modeling analysts, data scientists, and then also um, business analysts and clinical coders who understand the clinical data, the patient pathways. So there's a broad range and all of that is pulled together all under one roof to create a patient pathway that improves patient care. Um, and I guess that's one of the key messages we'd like to give today as well is, is just around the NHS banner of business in uh, business intelligence is really, really broad. And I think the key thing in all of that is transferable skills. And, and as we kind of go into the, the, the personal stories you hear about, so my background, I'm a lawyer, I hit the NHS kind of cold from having worked in private practice. But if you just focus on the transferable skills that you have, and look at the roles that are available, there's always opportunities out there. I'll now um, oops, pass you on to Cully, who's going to give us her um, personal story. Hi all, so um, yeah, I'm Cully Kaur, so my personal story is the third one on this. So um, my background is I came into the NHS with a background in a computer science degree and Later on in my career, I managed to get a master's in public health. So I've started from, I know I've said this before, so anyone that's heard Bernie's um, talk that I've done before, you'll have heard me go on about how I joined the NHS as a band three and how I worked my way up and how I've kind of gone from the informatic roles. So doing acute based roles as an information assistant and an information analyst, then followed through with a a stint in public health so to speak so did the information roles in there did the specialized intelligence analyst and then the public health intelligence manager from there I then went came into BI and and it wasn't a structured approach it was just I want to remain in the NHS public health is going into local authority what do I do 
a role came became available in BI. At that point, I didn't even know what BI was, but I must have done something right because I know I've done various roles in BI and it's now resulted in me being the head of the data processing and reporting unit. Um, and I think my story uh, is the one in teal blue is is probably similar in that I fell into where I am at the moment, but I I undertook a law degree, had a very clear career path for myself that I was going to be a lawyer and I'd be a partner in a law firm by the age of 30. The recession hit and everything changed. Um, I then joined the NHS and it was more of a stopgap. I came into the NHS with my most recent background in data analytics was GCSE IT. <laughs> um, and I was sold a role that was about contract management, which complemented my legal skills, but actually coming into practice, a lot of the role was data and analytics, and, and I was able to create a little niche for myself. So I kind of moseyed along half, half in, half out, you know, planning on going back to the law eventually. And a few years in, I thought, I need to make a decision now, either I go back to the law or I stay here. And if I'm staying, um, I felt like I needed some qualifications to hang my hat on because all my qualifications were law related and also to decide to kind of take my career a little bit more seriously rather than just just moving along and seeing what happened um, so I decided to stay I enrolled on the NHS Leadership Academy um, Masters in Healthcare Leadership which was great for that system understanding and knowledge of building up the networks um, I then um, settled in a role where I started off as, as head of business intelligence I was then encouraged to fill a gap that they had on the contracting side because I'm a legal background and you know fought against that saying I'm happy with the job that I'm doing at the moment but was convinced by the accountable officer that I should take it on and my legal background and the analytics complemented each other um, and one of my biggest blockers at the time was I had, I had three young children and I was like I can't do this and the accountable officer who was you know a, a female in a leadership position said you don't need to be apologetic about being a mum you can just say please don't set meetings for me after four o'clock because I have to leave the office and for me I think that was one of the pivotal turning points that I felt like yeah I can have a career and I can have a family life and balance it all um, I then went on to do various different roles within the CCG and joined Arden Gem um, about four months ago although it feels a, a whole lot longer <laughs> of being here so I'm Associate Director of Business Intelligence responsible for the Directly Commissioned Services I'm also a non-exec director within the care sector and recently joined um, as a non-exec director with a, with a community mental health trust. And, and I guess my um, take home message is this, just we all have the ability to take control of our careers and be very focused and be willing to change the plan. So my first six years in the NHS, every single year there was risk of redundancy. And after the first two years, it wasn't scary anymore. It was just I know that I land up somewhere and some everything will turn out all right in the end. And I guess the other the other message is that kind of reaching down and helping others will always benefit you in the long term. I'm a strong believer we're not in competition with each other. We're only in competition with ourselves of last year and ourselves, you know, two years ago. And and for me, I'm in competition with the asthma who stayed on that law path in a parallel universe. So I, the biggest take home message is just take control of your of your career path and also lift as you climb because we're all there. We're all amazing women and we should be encouraging each other and supporting each other. Um, I'll now hand you over to um, Co. Yeah. OK, so it's me and Green. Um, so <laughs> I think I kind of went to university. I had a bit of an expectation I'd go to university. And I think at the time I was quite into serial killers and cracker and I wanted to be like a crime profiler. So I actually did what I enjoyed, which was psychology and criminology. Um, I went on and did a master's in that. And I went into working with young offenders initially. Um, and it was sort of 12 to 17 year olds who were effectively in a juvenile prison, uh, sort of the youngest um, population we have very very violent offenders murders you know it, it you know quite a difficult place to work for long periods of time so I actually left that and went to I guess fulfill my other dream which was being this crime profiler so I worked for the police uh, as an intelligence analyst and um, sort of led on violent and sexual crime profiling trying to link um, them and do offender profiling um, and actually I left the police because the police is quite a difficult place to work as a female, as a young female, as a civilian. And I kind of look back now and think, you know, more experience, more, would, would I have tried to change things more and work in that space? But I actually left and um, joined the NHS 
um, and I've done tons of different analytical roles in the NHS. I think I'm sort of NHS through and through. I, I can't ever see myself working anywhere else. Live it. I've lived the opportunities I've had. Um, I've worked my way up through different service lead roles. I was head of BI for quite a few years. Um, and I think this is kind of where my quote comes in because I actually around this time in my career got the opportunity to do some personal development courses um, that focused a lot on self and group and conscious bias, um, like the stories you tell yourself. And it kind of gave me a bit of a drive to break out of what I'd always been doing and some opportunities came up internally. So I kind of moved into more of a program focused role, which then just ultimately ended up me working more with the applications team, um, more in the product ownership space. Um, and yeah, I just felt <laughs> that kind of spurred me on then to think, I kind of want to do a lot of different things. Um, I want to get a bit more breadth of different um, experience so quite recently I've said yes to another opportunity that's completely outside of my comfort zone which is product owner for the the uh, COVID data platform um, again I've just said yes and I'm kind of in that space where I'm not really sure what I'm doing um, but I've found some of the product owners and I've made friends with them and I'm just going to figure it out and um, yeah so that's me I'll go, I'll go next. I'm, I'm uh, the, the well, I don't know what colour it is, orange coat colour. So um, I'm a clinician by background um, and uh, I've been in the NHS for the whole of my career and I'm a bit like Co. and I don't think I'm going to escape either. Um, and neither do I want to really. So, so yes, I started as a diagnostic radiographer um, and uh, started my career on a district-wide um, way of working, which is feels like deja vu because that's what we're the NHS is promoting doing now. Um, and but rapidly um, ended up um, over five years uh, actually leading and and taking that service forward. Um, so that was quite a rapid progression and and a bit like the themes that uh, everyone said. You know, you're kind of thinking. Uh, it, it came I'm going to apply and then you get it and you think oh my god what have I done but anyway um, managed to, to survive to survive that and, and then got married and, and relocated to um, Leicester where um, initially um, I was engaged with one of the very first um, implementing well not engaged I led it the the first digital um, radiology service so there's nothing worse than doing like that you really are learning by doing because you can't look at what other people have done and I have to say you know a bit like the common themes that are coming out you know it didn't feel like when I was in the middle of it but I was learning something every day and then actual fact that's how I thrive um, and so in, and equally it's also how I learned to fail fast on certain things and accept that that's not a bad thing so long as I learn from it so um, on the back of that um, I was then um, asked to go into general management as a, on the back of a trust merger um, bringing three services who really didn't like each other to, together into one integrated service is a challenge in and out, on its, its own right. And this was in the middle of a very large um, acute hospital with a phenomenal, not just hospital, three hospitals with very significant challenges. So, you know, again, every day was about trying to find what we can do to improve. And the point I'd make, I'm not technical from a BI perspective. What I have been throughout the whole of my career is very analytical, being able to see how we can get more out of the data we've got, not just look at data and say, well, one number's bigger than the other, therefore, but, you know, well, what's that mean? You know, really what is happening and get digging underneath. And I think some of my colleagues, as I moved into being deputy director of ops in that organization, and I started using statistical process control type methodologies and, and actually trying to get us to focus on what's normal variation and what's significant. I think they all thought I came from another planet, but, but needless to say, uh, we, we were on a journey and uh, I think they are still um, adopting what, what I put in place at that point. So I'm quite proud about that. Um, and in respect to that acute provider, it got to the point really where um, I, as director of strategy, I felt I needed a new challenge. Um, and I was approached to um, apply having done a system wide role on service reconfiguration, which can be very career limiting. Um, I was um, kind of uh, pointed in the direction of what was at that time the associate director's role, um, similar to, to what Asma and, and Laura are doing now. 
Um, and and I thought, well, you know, it's a bit of, I'm a bit of a wild card to say the least, because I come from a frontline real world sort of sit situation. This is very technical. Can I do it? Um, in the end, um, I, I went for it. I got it. Um, and I think it's fair to say rapidly started to learn all of the acronyms associated with BI, which was quite threatening at the time, um, but also got the opportunity to work with the fantastic people, um, some of whom you, you're meeting this afternoon or this evening. And two years ago, I was asked to move into the executive director role. So I very much um, advocate for, for the opportunities that my my team and, and my services um, offer and more and more importantly and keeping true to myself as originally a clinician making sure that whatever we do can actually impact real world um, situations so so I guess back to my kind of quote really um, you know when you can't see the wood for the trees and you are in the middle of it and yes we all do jump into things and just say yes and then think oh my god what have I done it's about learning and I think so long as you can recognize and you've got the support around you to to realize that every day we're learning by doing um then then you know that's the most important thing and I think that's what defines how you can um handle things um, in a very positive um, manner, both as an in individual and as a woman in a le leadership position. So Laura, I think I'm passing to you. Yep, so hopefully everyone can hear me now. So I'm now probably a big head on a screen because I've moved a bit closer to the mic. Um, so yeah, so I'm the, uh, the purple blob at the bottom. Um, so according to my UCAS application, I'm currently about 20 years into an absolutely awesome gap year. Um, so yeah, I'm NHS through and through. Um, I started my uh, NHS um, career in Hertfordshire in the health informatics service. And like I say, it was my year out and I was lovingly known as the 10th with a brain, which was, uh, which was wonderful, I suppose. And I got to learn a hell of a lot. And because um, I was there temping, I was just given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and literally worked my way around that health informatics work. Um, so I ended up doing first line support for IT, um, Microsoft training, um, clinical system training, um, my background from school, I was a bit of a geek, so I did maths and computing, um, so as soon as they realised that, they had me doing coding, and, and somehow I managed to learn to code in Unix, which is, if anyone's ever used that, is horrendous. Um, I did some work with database administrator, um, oh sorry, I think people are struggling to hear me, I'll try and get a bit closer again. And um, so, yeah, really kind of bounced my way around. Um, and then at one point, someone realized that I was actually sat in a room um, coding and not really talking to anybody. So the training manager came and found me and asked me to if I'd be interested in doing some work with them around um, clinical system training and working on some national projects. Um, so I said yes. Um, so I worked on the NHS Connecting for Health and MP Fit, which is about um, trying to bring in like these, this super um, single source of the truth for NHS information systems, which, uh, which, which never quite happened the way we expected it to, uh, but it was fantastic to work nationally on that. Um, then the money for those projects ran out and I was put at risk and the HR director contacted me and said, would I be interested in working on their HR systems um, because they were moving from um, an old kind of antiquated system onto the national electronic staff record system. Um, so again, I said yes to that, um, did that for a little while, um, and then applied for a job in Leicestershire, which I didn't realise quite how far away Leicestershire was. I thought I'd be able to commute from Hertfordshire to Leicestershire, uh, but that wasn't possible. Um, so I ended up living in a house with three men for six months until we were, me and my husband were able to sell our house and move up to Nottingham where I was able to commute to Leicestershire. Um, then within Leicestershire, um, I was a workforce analyst and a workforce planner. So again, that was working with clinicians, working with universities, colleges, um, looking at um, data to try and work out um, how many nurses do we need over the next five, 10 years? Where are those nurses coming from? Have we got the right university courses? Are we approaching children in, um, in young adults in schools early enough to let them know of those job opportunities that were available? Um, what were the risks in the future? Um, so if anyone's ever looked at NHS workforce profiling, um, we've particularly within nursing, there's always been this kind of 
cliff of nurses that are about to retire. And there's not a lot of nurses coming through the system. Um, so I was part of a, a national scheme that was looking at bringing in nurse practitioners and trying to change the way that we had um, nurses coming through the system. Because it used to be um, almost vocational. Then they made all the nurses have to do a degree. And that stopped a lot of nurses coming through. Um, so that was incredibly interesting to look at and all of the OD that sat behind that. Um, somehow I managed to set up a new pension scheme in the NHS as well. I managed to manage the payroll contract. So again, this is just going back to someone asks you to do something, you turn around, you say yes, and then you figure out how the hell to deliver that afterwards. Um, so then an opportunity came up as a head of information. And to this day, and I don't know whether this is imposter syndrome, but to this day, I'm still not quite sure how I landed that job. Um, I'd been working very corporately. Um, I'd only ever really worked with workforce data. I didn't really know the NHS activity data particularly well, um, but I did have the leadership skills to manage the team, to do um, transformation, to do management of changes and, and create that team almost from scratch. Um, so I was brought in to do that. I managed to do that for five years and create um, a team within, the, within Leicestershire that I'm incredibly proud of and still incredibly proud of today. Um, and then in August, um, I was approached by the, uh, the, the chief data officer at the time um, to come and work in AGEM um, as their associate director of BI um, to help with a couple of um, projects that they were working on. And I've been here ever since. And I've been incredibly lucky during my journey. Um, I've had two interviews throughout my entire career, although I've managed to take up a number of jobs. So um, my quote is always say yes to every opportunity, network the hell out of everything. You know, your job is a piece of paper ultimately, and you can make it whatever you want it to be. And never feel pigeonholed. And at the end of the day, if someone asks you to do something, they can see something in you that you might not necessarily see yourself. So take the bull by the horns, say yes, surround yourself by people who are amazing. There will be people out there who are fantastic. And nine times out of 10, they're looking for a leader and someone just to pull them together. Because nine times out of 10, again, they know the answers, they know what they need to do, but they need some support to, to move forwards, to kind of move through those barriers. Uh, and, and deliver what we need to deliver. And um, sorry, I can feel the imposter coming out in me already. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna leave it there before I keep putting myself down and just say, yeah, you don't need to go to university to, to kind of achieve what you want to achieve. You can absolutely push yourself through. It's a little bit harder because you've got more to prove, um, but it's absolutely possible. So particularly if people have got um, children or family members or friends out there that are really struggling with university with COVID, it's not the end of the world. You know, people haven't been able to get their A-levels because of COVID. It is not the end of the world. Um, they, they can absolutely do this. Thank you.